And he took him aside from the multitude and put his fingers in his ears. And he spat and touched his tongue. Then looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. Immediately his ears were opened, and the impediment of his tongue was loosed, and he spoke plainly. In the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Today's gospel, of course, has to do with a man who could not speak. He could only make noises because he could not hear what he said. Though we want to be kind about it, uncontrolled outbursts in public are downright annoying. Parents sometimes have to wrestle with noisy children. In the worst cases, every parent considers heading out the door so that the rest of the congregation can have a moment of peace and not be distracted. This is especially true for solemn occasions like funerals and weddings. They demand silence. Mistaken parents often think then that they should probably just get a sitter for their children and leave them at home because, well, you can't control what and when they will say it. Of course, today's gospel is not about noisy children, but about one noisy adult. Some people simply cannot control what they say. But in this case, hearing the deaf mute man's moans and groans can be downright terrifying if we don't expect to hear them. So Christians from the very beginning have done their best to help these sorts of people. In a certain sense, they try to duplicate the miracle of Jesus by relieving their physical distress and through whatever means bringing them to faith in Jesus. Our Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod in particular, has well-endowed institutes in Detroit and Long Island to help people with hearing and speaking disorders. But of course, the impediment that the man suffered ultimately comes for everyone. We all eventually lose our hearing. Sooner or later, it will happen. But of course, there's another kind of hearing and speaking which is even more important than what we do with our ears and mouths. St. Paul says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved, Romans 10. Even if your hearing is gone, it's the divine hearing and speaking that really counts. This divine hearing and speaking does not come from taking a speech course or applying some technology or healing medicine. This divine hearing and speaking is worked in our hearts by the Holy Spirit through the gospel preached Jesus Christ and him crucified. It's true that science is making great strides in hearing and restoring it, even overcoming speech impediments. Nerve endings can be re repaired. Electrical signals can travel to and from the brain directly. Surgery can restore the speaking function of the tongue or the lips. Hearing devices can bring hearing to the once deaf. Even stuttering children can receive some relief through speech therapy. But hearing the gospel so that you believe is a miracle that only God can perform. Or, as the apostle says, no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So for the last 168 years, the Holy Spirit has worked the miracle of faith in this place, not through technology, not through therapy, not through healing medicine, but through a succession of faithful pastors and their preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. So if your faith is a miracle, then unbelief is also a mystery. If you have unbelieving relatives, you probably have asked yourself a thousand times why they don't believe. We can diagnose the loss of hearing, but we cannot diagnose the inability to receive the word of God. The prophet Jeremiah said, Hear this now, O foolish people, without understanding, who have eyes and see not, and who have ears and hear not. 
This unbelief defies our greatest efforts to understand it. Isaiah asks, who has believed our report? Isaiah 6. Jesus said that when he returned, he would find very little faith. So now, faced with the twin mysteries of belief and unbelief, faith and unfaith, we have no choice but to rely upon God, who alone creates the hearing of the gospel, so that we see our Lord Jesus Christ in every word that we preach or hear. All we can do is pray repeatedly, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. When Luther was asked how deaf people could hear the gospel and believe, he replied that the word of God creates its own hearing. Only God can create faith. So look around. The Lord has accomplished what he has promised. The prayers of this congregation have been heard, and for, again, 168 years, the miracle of faith has been worked, worked in you. People have heard the gospel and believed. God has opened ears. He has done this to entire families. He has done it with strangers. Jesus has been putting his fingers into your ears so that you can hear the message of redemption. He's unloosed your tongues to praise the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the sacred liturgy of the church and in her hymns. And so already today, your tongues have confessed that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father not through your effort or strength, but by his working. It's a divine miracle. Many congregations never even reach 50 years. That's true for the majority. Or drive through downtown Milwaukee or some other metro, and you'll see large, abandoned churches. People over 90 have even a more acute sense of this. Their dearest friends and relatives are gone. They've probably even seen some of these churches disappear. They made it and others have not. As a church, it must feel something like that. We made it. Others have not. And by anyone's standards, 168 years is an accomplishment and remarkable. But that's not quite the right way to think about it. We should say it is God's remarkable achievement and accomplishment that he has worked among you. 125 years after Luther's death, his church went into steep decline in Germany, and indeed it's never recovered. Lutheranism is not even a, really a majority option in Germany today. The past is no guarantee of the future. Thanks be to God that the faith confessed is alive in this congregation. Thank God and cry out for his mercy that your future may be just as prosperous as the past. It's not just true for the church in this place, but say the church in Israel. It was a united kingdom for, well, only 120 years. So we've outdistanced them by 48. Saul, David, and Solomon only each ruled for 40 years. And with Solomon, we pray that God would overlook our shortcomings. We pray that God would restore us when we fall through our own weakness and iniquity. We know that we are not worthy of any of these benefits. We are not made worthy by our merits, but only through the bitter sufferings and death of Jesus Christ, who continues to give his benefits to us through his gospel preached and his sacraments administered. Or as the psalmist said, not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but to your name give glory because of your mercy, because of your truth. We fall down in penitential sorrow before the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, beseeching him not to forsake his children. Create in us a clean heart, O God, and take not your Holy Spirit from us. Only St. Mark records the account of the healing of this deaf man with a speech impediment. The man is a nuisance, but he wasn't ignorant. He could make sounds, but no one understood them. Notice what Jesus does. He doesn't destroy the man. His value is not in his ability to hear or to speak. But instead, he created a new man. He took what was defected and completed it, perfected it. 
He changed the configuration in the man's mind so that the nerves could hear again. The Bible does not simply say that he could not speak. It says that he was also tongue-tied. So Jesus untied the knot of his tongue. His tongue was released from its cage and he spoke with glorious babbling. He was like the newborn right out of the womb or the adolescent who's just discovered what it is like to make a call on the telephone. Or maybe he's like the wise pastor who could never end his sermon. His speech was endless and magnificent because he spoke about what Christ had done for him. He could hear, and now he spoke without end. And the word that he spoke spread like wildfire. This kind of good news always spreads fast. Jesus command, commanded those who saw the miracle not to tell anyone, and they did exactly the opposite, and they told everyone. And the people everywhere believed. No one really knows for sure why Jesus told them to be quiet. But this shows that we do not have to be told to preach the gospel. We just do it. The miracle of evangelism is done when a mother or a neighbor brings the child to baptism or to catechesis. It happens when you bring along your house guests with you to church. This miracle of opening ears has happened here for 168 years, and we pray that God would continue for another. At the time of the Reformation, Luther wrote a baptismal rite that had some revisions, but it retained some of the ancient practices we might find superstitious. One of those customs was taken right out of today's gospel. The pastor would touch the ears and the tongue of the child or the adult. In baptism, Jesus is putting his fingers into your ears and putting his finger onto your tongue so that you might believe and confess him as Lord. As gross as it might sound, baptism is the divine spittle. <laughs> to paraphrase Luther, it is not the spittle or the saliva that works the miracle, but the word of God in that spittle or saliva or water that creates faith. He opens our ears to hear his gospel, and he opens our mouths to sing his praise. When you look at this congregation, you can say with the words of this gospel, Jesus has done all things well. He makes both the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. Thanks be to Jesus in his holy name. Amen. Amen.